hi there, my name is Fraser Simons. This is my channel, Springboard Thought, where I'm talking about the David Mitchell Uber novel slash meta novel, whatever you want to call it. All his oeuvre is interconnected, and uh, so people sometimes refer to it as this uber meta type situation. And I'm trying to chart my little course through all of these books uh, and chronicling the reading order that I am doing them in and sort of how that uh, interconnectedness is being revealed for me because the reading order essentially is very important is what I am told although David Mitchell himself said you could read them in whatever order there's a lot of thoughts and opinions about which ones you should read and when uh, and how it changes the experience for you so I thought it'd be fun to just chronicle it in this kind of way and I thought also it'd be a good time to uh, show that I've got some vinyl here instead of just changing them for how visually they look. It, I'd like to start recommending people listen to these specific things and how it relates to the actual story that I'm talking about. And so that's why I have the Dave Brubecker Quartet in Impre Jazz Impressions of Japan, because this story is about a European meshing with uh, Japan and that music is definitely indicative of that uh, and it's an impression of Japan and then the handsome furs I have uh, just because the sort of tone and mood gels very well with uh, Jacob's actual thought processes and the the, um, the story writ large basically and now I'll actually talk about the book. Today I'm going to be talking about the second book on my little David Mitchell Odyssey, The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zoot. So I learned how to pronounce it in between Cloud Atlas and now. I think it's even mentioned in the book, but I completely forgot or just skimmed over it or something. I don't know. But uh, this book is, it was told that I needed to definitely read this before the bone clocks because there's spoilers for the bone clock within it um, and at the time I was actually reading the bone clocks I was 30% in then somebody told me that so I put it down picked up this uh, thankfully I don't think anything was spoiled for me um, at least that I noticed the thousand autumns is about uh, something that is historic it's historical fiction but it's based in historical fact and then everything else is extrapolated or at least many things about it are extrapolated in it. Uh, it's about the Dutch East Indian trading company that was at the time the only thing uh, Japan was trading with in the late 1790s to 1800 uh, when they were isolated otherwise. There was a constructed island called Dejima where uh, they erected this place just for this trading to occur and only the Dutch were allowed to come and trade. And on the island, only merchants, interpreters, and uh, high-class prostitutes essentially was able to even enter the island whatsoever, aside from uh, powerful figures that you would expect like the magistrate and stuff like that. But otherwise it was just these people, there was only trading to occur within season, and that's all that place was used for whatsoever. Um, so it's very interesting. I hadn't known about this at all, basically. Like, I think what I was taught in Canadian history was Japan was completely isolated. I don't think they mentioned anything about this at all. So it was very fascinating. And it's quite clear that David Mitchell did a lot of research on this because the mannerisms of the crew, the um, sort of cultural things that were happening from both points of view, and uh, looks, sounds, sights, everything seems like it just has the air of authenticity about it. And I think he's talked about how he did research for it uh, a wild amount of time. So that all makes sense. The book is broken up into five different parts. The first part is Jacob's uh, perspective exclusively from the time that they get into the port 
to um, a sort of inciting incident, basically, or a, yeah, basically the inciting incident for it. So it, uh, it takes up about 200 pages of the 480 or so, and then things pr rapidly progress from that point. Uh, we meet other characters, of course, when he joins the port, who later become perspectives in parts two, three, four, five. Uh, with the fifth one being just an epilogue for Jacob. Um, in that time, we mostly are acclimating to the port and to learning the sort of like moral character of Jacob as he is tested because the uh, initial premise is that uh, they've come to port specifically to encounter the rampant corruption that has been taking place. His former, or not his former, but a former um, resident, the captain, and sort of colluding partners have been misrepresenting what has been sold uh, and brought back to the Dutch motherland, etc. Uh, and Jacob is a clerk in, who is there in order to interrogate and ascertain exactly what has been swindled and not. So he has to work with interpreters to interrogate their own books uh, and accounting, which is supposedly, at least ostensibly, correct versus the Dutch one, and then see like where the what's been skimmed, and all that kind of stuff. So he's not very uh, endeared to the crew because he's kind of seen as like a rat, uh, but the the captain has promised him a, like a high-ranking position and his sort of internal motivation for doing all of this is that uh, he's been promised that if he kind of gets on with the company and does a four-year stint I think it is maybe five years where uh, if he's kind of proven his medal and got on with the company uh, the father of a predominant woman Anna who he's in love with has promised that he can then marry Anna whereas now he doesn't have the social standing or money to do so and so the book is very concerned with a few different things it's concerned with the Western centric uh, characterization of Japan and Orientalism in general which I think it does quite well uh, Jacob is very open-minded not racist and um or at least not intentionally racist he has some internalized racism and misogyny from just growing up in uh, a western centric sort of uh, mindset but he's much more open-minded in contrast to his crew who are very crude and have very stereotypical assumptions about japanese people and that's how they're characterized so there's a uh, uncomfortable lens at work especially in the first half there and it works up to a point where Jacob has a moral quandary to solve he falls in love at least a kind of love with another character Orito who is uh, a character that we learn more about later on but it is initially like a very western centric fetishization of um an asian woman basically and he doesn't even really know her or is able to um get to know her all that well in social situations so he's sort of trying to engineer circumstances in which he's able to and it still feels very like um, wooing the foreigner trope type deal which is um, but it's still subverted and is it knows what it's doing essentially and is interrogating that trope so I found it very interesting and all of the stuff is just very compelling but it is very granular so keep that in mind if you're somebody who doesn't like to know about every single smell, sight, sound, uh, etc. in a certain place and the non-sweeping stakes like there's whole chapters where it is a specific day and the things that happen that day it does sometimes jump but it's always linear 
and it's uh, always just tracking these kind of like small, humble-ish <laughs> uh, lives that are going through the port and whatnot. So it, it, the stakes are initially quite low and then things start ramping up in the second half, which I would call the inciting incident, which is um, one of the characters, Orito, the person that Jakob is obsessed with essentially, is uh, disappeared and taken to a, a monastery where she ha is forced to go because her uh, father or I think it's her father dies uh, essentially and she's basically sold to this very powerful person uh, in order to settle debts and she is required to go to a shrine in which women are essentially subjugated um, they're forced to give birth to people that are then given away and it's a sort of monastic secret society type situation going on and then that's contrasted with a different character who's a translator who's in pretty good standing has a sort of um trifecta effect with Jakob and Orito in a lover's triangle type deal uh, but is unable to fulfill his love for Orito because the social standing aspect he's not allowed to marry her so he marries somebody else and so it's all sort of coagulating and, and coming together and interesting stakes are uh, very much catalyzed with a decision that I won't spoil in the first bit. Anyway, uh, I gave this four stars. I really liked it. It's very intelligent. It subverts a lot of tropes. It's vivid. It's well written. It's uh, the only uh, two points that I have against it is it's written in dialect, but that's for a purpose. It's very much trying to examine how communication and language and translation and who has the power and that sort of dichotomy and relationship is able to uh, sway certain situations and characterize other people, portray them, etc. And um, so written in dialect makes sense, but it's also kind of working against the tropes that it's trying to subvert in, um, in depicting uh, Asian people and Japanese people because they come off as the sort of stilted language uh, deferential type of people and it is contrastive and it goes into the other parts with the Japanese centric viewpoints but it still just feels kind of weird and it's also very dense to read and get through it took me a while to read this book and so that I didn't like and then just the first part the 200 pages is a lot of setup to get through it's interesting but it did get to a point where I thought, like, is this actually going anywhere? Is the only stakes that I need to learn about is Jakob going for this Asian woman while having Anna in his heart or whatever, because that's kind of interesting, but not really. Thankfully, that's not the case, and there's far more going on in the story. Um, but it is, a, it gets to be a tiny bit of a slog after you get introduced to everything and you're steeped in the world and whatnot. So it probably could have had an inciting incident a little bit sooner. Otherwise, I thought it was great. I gave it four stars, like I said, so it exceeded my expectations. And now I'm going to talk about how it situates, at least as far as I know, into the David Mitchell Uber novel type part of the story because all of the books for David Mitchell are interconnected and I'm on my little journey of reading them all. So. Uh, and this is obviously spoilers for the book that I'm going to be covering as well. So if you don't want to know that, then stop and then come back after you've read it or what have you. The wild thing, <laughs> very wild thing, kind of like a supernatural aspect to the story. There's still the overall thematic um, David Mitchell stuff happening where it's kind of like good versus evil and um, it's testing the moral fibers of the individuals in the stories. And um, faith and religion is actually like a more predominant uh, 
symbol or theme in it where Jacob is Christian and he is rooted in his faith for doing the right things quite a lot. And then the sort of antagonist is in Abbott who has accrued a lot of power that is like inordinate for a person of his stature. And he actually runs the shrine where Orito is sent and subjugated basically. There is uh, no content warnings that I need to say for um, graphic or um, insensitive or even really a, a rape or sexual assault scene never takes place in it but is alluded to and sort of commonplace with the consent of the women but they are still subjugated and it's though consensual still very much depicted as the wrong thing to do but even more complex than that is these people uh, these women are giving birth to um, children who uh, they are unsure of who the father is but it is one of these monastic type uh, people the people who follow the order uh, that the abbot is the head of and they are made to kill these children before a certain point in which the soul is supposedly like sort of dug in to the children. Uh, so they kill them beforehand and they're able to make a sort of um, elixir from this somehow that extends their life. So how it ties into Cloud Atlas, I'm not entirely sure. It may not at all, but in the last parts of Cloud Atlas, there's people who live very long lives, and I'm wondering if they maybe consume something like it and I just didn't remember in Cloud Atlas. Um, or I wonder if some of these characters are in Cloud Atlas and I just, it's been so long that I haven't uh, connected them and their lifespan is, you know, has the pen potential to be in these stories. I wonder if it's written quite a bit like the Frobisher first story in Cloud Atlas, and uh, so I wonder if there's some overlaps there. I might have to uh, Google it once I'm done my whole little journey. Right now I just want to sort of see what associations my brain is going to make from just consuming this content, and we'll see what to make of it. And then later on, after I've read everything and um, sort of gotten all I can in the last video or something maybe, I'll... Um, sort of do more research and see what all is happening and going on. But that's sort of the only uh, component that I'm aware of. I don't think Jakob or any of the characters make an appearance, but there's an open-endedness for even some of the side characters to appear in other David Mitchell books, because the previous uh, captain that Jakob has sort of like abscond somewhat and so it, it almost feels like that story is not completely over because some people are like if I ever find that guy oh boy that kind of stuff so maybe they do find that guy or maybe there's some allusions to it in other books who knows we'll find out but um, yeah I thought it was fantastic it introduces this weird elixir potion thing I don't know if uh, everybody who is an antagonist or something in the other books are going to be extending their lives in the same way or if it just wants to introduce a, an element but I know because I was told that Bone Clocks has you know the I have to read this because it would spoil some of the Bone Clocks so presumably some of these characters or the elixir or something like that is going to appear in the Bone Clocks which I'm going to be taking up today, and we'll go from there. So if you've read any of these books, let me know. If you have a um, suggestion for a reading order, I'd particularly like to know, especially the reasoning behind it. And um, if you just in general want to talk about The Thousand Autumns or have questions, feel free to comment, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Otherwise, I will see you for the next video in this uh, David Mitchell Uber thing, which is going to be the bone clocks, as I said. See you later.